Advertising and media, up next on Carpe Diem. Welcome to Carpe Diem. I'm Merrill Brown, Director of the School of Communication and Media at Montclair State University. Joining me today to talk about how dramatically the nature of advertising is changing and about his forthcoming book, The Future of Men, Masculinity in the 21st Century, is award-winning documentary film producer, author, and Myers Biznet's chairman and media ecologist, Jack Myers. Jack, a leading consultant and demography expert on ad trends, has been a media business visionary for over three decades. He describes himself as one of his, on one of his sites as, quote, a media executive father, grandfather, and ex-husband. His varied career includes sales management positions at CBS, ABC, and Metro Media. He's chairman of the board of the International Radio and Television Society and is a member of the board of Syracuse University's Newhouse School of Communications. In addition, he has served on the advisory board for the Steinhardt School of Culture, Education, and Human Development at New York University. His last book, Hooked Up, A New Generation's Surprising Take on Sex, Politics, and Saving the World, won the International Book Award for Youth Issues. Welcome, Jack. It's good to be here, Merrill. Thanks for coming. Uh, let's dive right into the state of television today, something you've chronicled for many, many years. It's a dramatic moment in both programming, how people get television, and about how advertising is bought and sold. In general, how do you view the state of television in 2015? Very challenging. It's uh, beyond chaotic. It's, it's been changing. I, for as long as we've been in the television business, we've always said we're in a, in a medium that, that is uh, changing quickly. Uh, but the fundamental business models for the past 50 years of the television and media industry in general have not changed. What we're seeing is a massive uh, shift, transformation of the fundamental underpinnings, business underpinnings of the television and, and broader media industry. So I look at the next five to ten years as not just a period of change, not just transition or transformation or evolution or even revolution, but complete metamorphosis, the, 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 uh, the caterpillar turning into the, uh, the butterfly. And uh, when the butterfly flies away, uh, we don't know where it's going to fly or where it's going to land. And there are a lot of husks and shells left on the ground. And, and so I think the next few years are going to be uh, really tumultuous in the business. You like to, as you say, rant about change and really try to cheerlead and encourage, and encourage the industry to change rapidly. How is the industry coping with this change and are they doing enough to recognize all that's going on around them? No, they're not doing enough. Uh, the industry really looks at itself as having done a very good job at adapting to the digital uh, opportunities that have been there. It was little, the broadcast industry was very slow on the uptake uh, in the 80s uh, to cable. Uh, they quickly caught up and we're seeing incredible uh, success and growth in, in broadcast investments and partnerships uh, in building cable enterprise. And uh, if, if you talk to most of the executives in the, in the television, both cable and broadcast, and, and on the di distribution side as well as on the programming content uh, side, uh, you'll get pretty positive feedback about uh, their, their adaption to uh, the digital age. The reality is that the adaption has not been quick enough and it's not been dramatic enough and not been aggressive enough. So uh, while the industry believes that it's avoiding the pitfalls that the newspaper industry found itself in and, and the challenges and, and the collapse of uh, advertising revenues and, and uh, circulation revenues in the newspaper business by more than 50 percent over, over the last uh, decade and a half. Um, the industry is, is the television industry I believe is about to go through a similar collapse of, of its both its advertising and its distribution revenues. And yet 2015 based on your forecast looks pretty good doesn't it? It depends on how you how you look at pretty good. Uh, the cable we're looking at overall uh, revenues being down in the 
traditional upfront marketplace. Uh, if they're down by 2%, I think the industry will look at that as being pretty good. The forecast for the broadcast side of the upfront are down 5 to 8% in revenues, which is compounded on 5 to 8% losses, uh, declines in revenues last year. Cable was up uh, a couple of points last year, but it looks to be down, uh, flat to down a, a point or two this year. Uh, so the upfront this year will, will give us a clear indication of whether we're in uh, a, a truly a secular shift and, and that, that is likely to continue. In terms of year-to-year -year revenues, uh, I'm moderate on this year's decline. Broadcast and cable still are, are the engine that pulled the marketing train, but marketers are, there, there are some really clear issues in uh, the way they're buying, the shift to digital, the over-the-top issues, the rate, continued ratings erosion, uh, the, the, the consolidation in, uh, of the industry, uh, the increased amount of supply in the marketplace, and marketers having a lot of alternatives in terms of where they go with their advertising dollars. You, you, drew, you just threw one of the great uh, phenomena of our moment in television onto the table, and that's over the top, or mm -hmm. OTT as the industry re uh, refers to it. That's a really important 2015 phenomena. Is it a threat or an opportunity or a little of both for the broadcasting world? Great question, and, I, and it's, it's all of the above. Uh, it's definitely an opportunity. Uh, Define it, though, uh, if you wouldn't mind, for the audience. Well, over the top, uh, Netflix viewing is over the top. Uh, what Apple TV, the announcement in just the last couple of weeks of the Apple TV and what they're doing and some of the partnerships that the networks are entering into with Apple to distribute their content is over the top. Uh, viewing that's not on the linear channels uh, over, the, over the traditional cable or satellite operators are over the top. Uh, when you study the, the realities of television, a lot of people get wrapped up in the technology. I get wrapped up more in the culture. And, and the money, which you evaluate. Clearly the economics, uh, but what drives the economics, uh, the advertising economics and the distribution economics, are the, uh, the audiences and the access to audiences and the ability to communicate advertising messages and to sell your content through distribution partners to the audiences. And the audiences are fundamentally changing. Uh, we're here at, at Montclair State and, and you look at uh, the students, uh, what percentage of them are uh, viewing through traditional means. It's far smaller than, than it ever was and, and declining. And the question is, as students graduate and begin to grow their families and move into uh, more traditional uh, adult lives, will they become subscribers to cable and, and, and in much smaller numbers? Um, they'll, be, they'll have far more opportunities now how they pay for those opportunities and, and how they shift. And, uh, but the advertising on those over-the-top options is radically different. Some of them don't have DVR capabilities. There are just as many commercials and, and you have the traditional intrusive pattern. But the likelihood that audiences are willing to uh, pay and uh, accept advertising in their viewing is is growing more and more difficult to uh, to move into uh, uh, the model. So, advertising opportunities, the impressions are shrinking at the same time that supply of inventory is expanding, and and that's kind of, we've kind of got a perfect storm of things happening that put the the total advertising models under a lot of pressure. As a consumer, though, we've got it pretty good, right? We have our Netflix subscription. We have lots of people investing in programming. Obviously, Amazon, Netflix, and other quote-unquote new producers aren't just throwing old stuff up on the air. They're investing very significant, significant amounts of money on important new shows, House of Cards being the most visible one of those. Mm -hmm. This is good from a consumer's point of view, isn't it's it? It's great for a consumer's point of view, and, and we will look back at this period, the last five years, probably the next five year period, as a, as a truly golden age of, of content. The amount of, of not only great content, but important content being produced and by important, I don't just don't mean the documentaries that are being underwritten and, and the stories, the type of uh, work that HBO is doing, not just on uh, uh, great 
programs like Game of Thrones, but also on the Robert Durst program, uh, The Jinx, and, and their documentaries, their films, uh, is extraordinary. Uh, I believe Mad Men ultimately will be proven to be one of the most important series in history, and the fact that this is coming out of commercial television on AMC is, we would not have believed that a few years ago, the kinds of programs we're seeing on FX, on, uh, on AMC, and increasingly on the broadcast networks as well. But the economics of being able to fund $4 million to $6 million per episode programming, uh, whether that, that can be sustained in, in the future is really uh, questionable. A lot of the, the funding comes from having not just those original runs, but the back end, the international distribution, and the opportunities to continue funding them. The amount of money that Netflix is putting into off-network programming, the fact that uh, Seinfeld is up for auction at $500,000 per, uh, $500, per episode uh, is, is extraordinary uh, when you look at uh, the number of episodes, 139, 140 episodes that uh, that, that funds, uh, and the economics of that going on to an Amazon or, or an Apple TV um, while still being in syndication, uh, that's not sustainable. Right. That's a nice transition, though, in mentioning Mad Men to uh, one of our other topics today, and that is men. You've written about Mad Men extensively and about how the Don Draper character, who's now, I guess, in his final spring of new episodes in front of us, uh, how the Don Draper character represents a lot about where the American male is headed, both mm -hmm. symbolically and in real terms. Tell us a little bit about your take on men, and in particular, what Don Draper and that character means. Well, in studying media and the economics of media, as I said before, I, I look at culture and the, and the implications of culture, and I've been studying uh, culture and society for, for 30 years and, and writing about the, the connection between culture and media. And uh, A few years ago, I, uh, you mentioned my other book, Hooked Up, I, w I was studying uh, the impact of the internet on, uh, on culture and society and really focusing in on the uh, the young people who are uh, uh, pre and post internet age, with the, in, uh, the first internet browser being a mosaic being 1993. So I studied the, the group of young people who were born 90 to 96 and seeing if there were any patterns or parallels pre and post. And what I found is that, first of all, millennials are uh, calling them a single cohort is absurd, saying a 17 year old and a 34 year old are are one cohort, uh, and I found this young group of uh, who are called a bridge generation, the hooked up generation, uh, who, who bridge the uh, pre and post internet, and I and I found a uh, a female culture, uh, a, a dominant female culture emerging, and, and I found many economic trends that show that uh, the uh, women's movement of the past 30 years has actually been extraordinarily successful, will continue to be successful. And we're moving from a, uh, an age of do a centuries old age of male dominance to uh, a future uh, where female will be increasingly uh, dominant. And uh, the economic trends we could talk about for, for the full uh, 30 minutes well, Let's here. tie that to Don Draper. So going back to Don Draper, uh, what are the implications for men? And what are the implications for the definition of a real man? And you know, part of our culture has become, uh, you know, boys will be boys, and, and an acceptance of uh, educational uh, models that do not uh, embrace, uh, you know, the, the traditional realities of of uh, boyhood. Uh, so Don Draper really personifies. Uh, the shift from a traditional kind of uh, Cary Grant, Clark Gable, uh, real man masculinity, uh, a man who doesn't really, who, who treats women as uh, some, you know, something that he uh, uses, he treats his, his family as irrelevant, he, his, li his uh, life is built on lies and deceit and self-identity that has really nothing to do, that he, that he, how he is perceived has really nothing to do with who he truly is. 
And you see his downfall, you see his collapse, and we, we see, you know, whether the, the story will evolve in terms of whether there's redemption or whether there's continuing uh, collapse. And that's what I've been studying and writing about. What are the implications for men as we go through this transition where um, lies and deceit are no longer acceptable, when the traditional uh, male strength th through physical strength or economic strength are, are no longer uh, Valued, accepted or, right. or valued. And then we look at media and advertising and we look at how men have been portrayed for the last two, three decades and longer in television and content as well as advertising. And we see the male role models in television that young men who are now coming into their adult years have been shown. And who is the most iconic TV dad of the last two decades? That would be Cosby, I assume. Well, Cosby, which is a whole other story. That's a whole other story about uh, male that, failure. That goes yes. back beyond the last 20 years. The last 20 years, I, I would argue, and, and my research has shown, that it's Homer Simpson. Mm. And number two, Peter Griffin from The Family Guy. So we have animated dads being the role models, number one, and certainly not father figures that we want our young men to personify. You also look at Homer Simpson when he first came on, he was a dad who was trying to do the right thing. He was a buffoon, he didn't do it well, but he tried to do the right thing. Now he even doesn't even try to do the right thing, he's just a buffoon. And uh, you look at advertising and, and you see beer ads uh, historically where uh, the men were with each other. They, they were, and, and women served them, beautiful, beautiful, scantily clad women served them. Or you see men who were such, uh, uh, so incompetent that they couldn't even find their own analgesic or figure out how to you know, use a, a, a towel to wipe a, a counter paper towel. So uh, we've had male role models in, in media and advertising that are just not acceptable role models and that has to end and end now and we have to start teaching our young men and our boys different definitions of what a real man is, a more empathetic real ma uh, man, a, a more uh, an honest man that we can't deny, deny, deny that we have to learn that, that, that truth is, is fundamental and honesty is fundamental. We need to start rebuilding our educational system. We need to restart uh, with more focus on men. Uh, we're here in a university setting. Uh, 60 to 65 percent of college students nationally are female. Graduates are female. A higher percentage of grad students. Uh, two out of three every new job uh, requires a college education and again college women are getting those jobs. 13 of the top 15 growth industries are dominated in middle and junior management by women and over the next two decades we'll see the glass ceilings being shattered at corporation after corporation. Hope you're right about that. The data on that is limited to date. But to date, right but, but we are seeing a lot of economic data that uh, corporations with uh, a higher percentage of women board members are, are economically performing in Scandinavian countries and some European countries. It's required that 40 percent of a board be female. We'll see those uh, laws, if not laws, we'll certainly see those actions being taken up in the U.S. So we're seeing a, a definite shift. Uh, many of the declining categories are, are male dominated. So uh, the women, uh, 18 to 34 year old childless single women are out earning 18 to 34 childless single men by 18 to 20 percent. Uh, so we're seeing a lot of dynamics uh, through society where we need to really start bringing the conversation to what are the implications for men how do we start developing a different narrative around and about and for men uh, while we continue to move the uh, women's ad, uh, advances further forward? We can't, it's, it's not at the expense of women, it's, it's really empowering women to be uh, more uh, understanding of some of the issues of, of their success uh, on men and to embrace and, and develop opportunities for men as well. And your book about men will be out this fall, right? We have to tout It'll be it a out little in the bit fall, here. but uh, we're, we've just launched the, uh, the crowdfunding uh, around the book. We're doing something publishing very different, a company called InkShares. Uh, and if I can give a gratuitous plug, it's uh, inkshares.com backslash Jack-Myers. 
uh, where the crowdfunding and where we're, uh, we're, we're featuring a number of, of videos and commentaries about the book. Uh, chapters are available there. Uh, and uh, crowdfunding is, would be a topic for a future uh, conversation, but we'll it's an that. exciting new, uh, new business model around publishing and media as well. I'd like to come back to Hooked Up, though, the book about the youth culture, and talk about that for a minute. In that book, you said that the Internet uh, uh, demographic is the most aware generation ever. I found that very interesting. Why is that? There is a body of thought that says young people today are less connected to news and public affairs than previous generations. How do you define uh, connected? Well, they're connected. They're getting their news in completely different ways. They're getting their news th through Twitter. They're getting their news through Tumblr, through Reddit. Uh, but they are getting more news uh, than ever before. Does that equal awareness? Because you, you use that word. You say they're the most aware generation. They're, they're far more aware of the issues. They're far more aware of international realities. They may not have the depth uh, that you get in a newscast, but, Merrill, you and I may, may watch the, uh, the network news at 6.30 or 7 o'clock, and we don't actually get much depth of coverage on a lot of issues. Even if you watch CNN or, or Fox News or N MSNBC, you could question whether you're getting real depth of news. I think what young people are getting is what is the popular culture uh, saying about the news? What is the commentary? What is the narrative around the news? They're getting far more understanding of, of the cultural impact of news. Uh, the uh, uh, Middle East issues were, were spread by young people globally and, and in this country. Arab Spring and so forth. Arab Spring and, and the, uh, the, the issues around 99% and the 1%. That was all spread, that was news being spread through popular culture and, and through completely new kinds of communications uh, media. So I believe they're, they're aware. They're aware on a different level. They're knowledgeable on a different level. And they're communicating it, participating in the news uh, at a, at, in a completely different way. But I believe they're, they're knowledge base. Certainly the, the issues we're seeing around gay marriage, the, the issues we're seeing around women's rights, the issues we're seeing around voter uh, repression, there's far more awareness of these issues. Uh, the, the issues around rape culture are, are, are being uh, advanced uh, on college campuses and, and in high schools by, uh, by young people. And I think that the, the advances we're seeing in many of these issues, as well as the backlash that we're seeing in, in other uh, uh, areas, are, are caused by young people being far more aware and far, being far more active. They may not be out marching on the streets, but they're marching with their fingers on uh, in their mobile devices and on their uh, desktops. And in social media, of course. Um, so let's tie all this about back to television again. And how do you imagine that generation is going to be consuming television in five or ten years? Much different than the way we have. And among the reasons I ask is it seems the basic program formats of television are eternal and long-lasting. You talked about the value, the value of a Seinfeld half-hour episode. People still love half-hour comedies and hour-long dramas. How will people get their television? And are these formats, in fact, eternal? The formats are eternal. Uh, new formats are evolving. Six-second Snapchats are uh, one of the fastest-growing forms of, of media and, and content communications. Fifteen-second Instagrams, uh, video tweets, audio t uh, tweets. Uh, uh, we've seen a, a resurgence of uh, audio uh, with serial on, on NPR. Uh, so yes, I, I believe that the 30, and, let me rephrase that, I believe that the 23 minute format or 22 minute format without commercials, uh, the 40, 42 minute format without commercials are eternal. It's the commercial model that I think is in jeopardy. It does seem like Snapchat and YouTube and all the new medium that so many young people are producing for, at the end of the day, it's all about getting them a sitcom on a network. <laughs> isn't it? I mean, isn't that still the eternal goal? Because that's where the eyeballs and the commerce is. Well, that it's. it's I, you could argue that it's the new form for comedians. It's the new form of stand-up. The stand-up is on YouTube, as uh, in addition to or the, the clubs, or and even as opposed to being on the club. That's where you get discovered. That's where your career gets developed. There are there are true celebrities emerging out of Snapchat. 
there, are, there will be new news anchors uh, emerging out of Snapchat and out of Instagram and other video distribution channels and out of YouTube. Uh, but whether that's to get the traditional 22 or 30 minute network series, I think that's a real big question because uh, the, the audience is, is shifting away from that. The reality of being able to watch programming on demand and being able to go into libraries of programming, <clears throat> how long will the Game of Thrones be a huge hit? I think Game of Thrones will be a hit program uh, for decades uh, going into the future. When will the next Game of Thrones come along? When will the next Mad Men come along that have that kind of cultural impact and societal impact and are mass truly mass media when a successful program is a 1.7 rating uh, instead of the traditional need to have a 10 rating. Uh, you know, I but there are more and more deep-pocketed people in a position to finance that kind of television, right? Again, you know, Amazon, Google, um, uh, the Netflix people, they have really unlimited capital in some ways to finance quality television. So that's another reason to be optimistic that there will be another Game of Thrones, Yeah, but right? the financing is deficit financing right now. Netflix, is, in their original model, is to bring new subscribers in, new members in. Uh, Amazon is building their Amazon Prime and building out distribution models and bringing loyal audiences in. Apple will invest. Uh, AOL, Yahoo, yes, they'll continue to invest in high-quality original content. And I believe that high-quality, professionally produced original content has to be differentiated for advertisers as a very high quality and important venue. But a lot of the venues like Netflix are not advertiser supported yet. Uh, so the, those, how, how long that deficit financing continues remains to be seen. I, yes, we probably have another decade beyond that. I'm not willing to uh, look that far forward. And I'm someone who likes to look far forward. Absolutely. That's your profession in many ways. Just we have a few seconds left. Is there some piece of television, some network, some show that's a little bit under the radar screen that you're in love with that you should tell the viewing audience about? Uh, well, on a program basis, I, I love the Americans on FX. I think FX and AMC are really doing uh, interesting jobs. Uh, scripts networks, uh, because of the endemic quality of the programming where they're talking to specific audiences with specific interests, I like a lot. Great points. Thank you, Jack. And thanks for coming today. I've enjoyed it. If you would like more information about this episode of Carpe Diem or any Car Carpe Diem episode, you can write to us at the email address on your screen, carpe diem at mail.monclair.edu, or call us at 973-655-5158. For Carpe Diem, I'm Merrill Brown. Thanks for watching.